Would you join us as we welcome the Lord this morning in the presence of our midst and join, thank him for joining us here together. from Nehemiah chapter 8. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the teacher of the law to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. 
Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And all God's people said, joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of Thank you, Sarah. Beautiful way to lead into worship today. I am delighted to welcome you and to see you after not seeing you for a week. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, and I'm just more fonder of you now. No, I'm not. That's not true. Uh, it's good, though, that we're back in the Lord's house today, and if you're our guest, we're thrilled that you're here. And the only thing we ask is that you would tear off the fly leaf and put it in the worship in the, um, from the worship bulletin and put it in the offering plate as it, pa as it passes. Uh, today, we are looking at the book of Nehemiah and a passage in 1 Corinthians on what does it mean to be church. And in our music today, uh, much of our hymns, many of our hymns and the specials come from Negro spirituals. You'll recognize that today. In recognition of the holiday on Monday of um, Martin Luther King Month and... Um, and remembering the wonderful contributions that African-American uh, brothers and sisters in Christ bring to the church. And we celebrate that today through their music. Uh, I'm going to ask you to pray with me as we dedicate this hour to the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we come at your invitation. You called us by name. You found us. And you invited us here today. And so today we come to confess to you that we are not yet what we can be. We confess to you that we are selfish. That we are nearsighted. That we have wronged others. 
And we confess that to you, O oh Lord. We ask for your forgiveness. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. And as was read and as Sarah sang, today we find our strength in your joy for us. Meet us here, O oh Lord. Lead us to Jesus. And lead us closer to each other. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for our children to come down now for the children's sermon to meet Miss Susan right over here. And for the rest of us to stand and greet those right around you. Good to see you today if I haven't already seen you. I brought with me today a game that you may be familiar with. You ever seen Operation? Yes. This is our little man that sometimes needs a little bit of help to make his body work appropriately. Um, but if you'll notice, he has many different parts on his body, just like we do, right? And we can name them all. And uh, the body, as you probably know, is designed to work together, right? You know, your feet get you where you need to be. Your eyes help you see where you need to go. Uh, your ears help you follow instructions. Your heart does very important work. Your kidneys, all of those things work together to make a whole body, right? We're not disconnected or any of those kinds of things. So we're at our best when our body is all working together, right? And if your body parts, if they could fight amongst each other and your eyes said, well, I don't want to work today. I'm not going to help you get to where you need to be or 
you know, if your heart said, you're on your own today, I'm tired, I'm not pumping, that would cause a problem, right? Um, so we could go through all these scenarios about how our body has to work together as one whole thing, right? Now, there are some people we know who, who don't necessarily have all of their body parts that are working that are still living and functioning, and that's an awesome thing that they're able to do that. But again, we're at our best when our body works together. Did you know that the Bible says that um, our church is the body of Christ? Did you know that? And that we work best as a church when everybody is working together. Now, when we are a part of a church body, God has given us each a very special gift. So, Brooke, your may, gift may be to sing, or your gift may be to lead a Bible study class, or your gift may be to uh, help us have a soccer program, you know, for kids to join and be a soccer program. Braden, maybe your gift is to preach, you know. But we all have a gift that God's given us that helps us make the church work together as one whole. Because if as church members, I'm looking at Avery and saying, Avery, your job's not very important. What are you even doing here? I, you know, I don't know what your job is kind of thing. Or Maggie, if I say, well, it's not, you know, it's no big deal whether or not we get some good exercise and we play together. Your job's not very important. So if we're arguing amongst ourselves, right, then are we really getting the job done that we're supposed to? No, we're just always fighting. The same way it is in your house, right? Yeah. So the body is designed, <laughs> mine too sometimes, the body is designed, our church body is designed to work together. And it works best when we're getting along with one another. When you're doing your job, I'm doing my job, Brother Jim's doing his job, and on and on and on, right? So let's remember that the church is really God's body and that he's given us a job to do and that most important job is to go out and to tell others about Jesus and his great love, right? So let's pray and let's ask God to help us work together as his body to get his work done. Thank you, Father, for this day. Father, thank you for our physical bodies. Father, that help us do the physical work. Father, Thank you for the spiritual gifts and the gifts of talents that you've given to each of us. Father, help us to remember that we are your body and that our job is to go out and to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to help and love others. Father, help us to keep in our heads and in our hearts that we are designed to work together. In Jesus' name, amen. Our ministry highlights today are our second session of the Mindfulness Seminar, which was canceled last week, uh, leaves us with two more weeks of the seminar. So if you were unable to attend the first one, you're still welcome to come tonight and next Sunday. And they start at 5 o'clock and they end at 6.30. They will meet in room 101 behind the church offices. We have a market day coming up on February 8th and 9th. We're looking for baked goods, and if you're willing to make, make one for the sale, um, please contact Marianne Abel or Jane Grease and let them know that you're willing to do that. It's almost Valentine's Day, guys, so you've got to remember your special one, and we are going to be celebrating our Valentine banquet on Saturday, February the 16th. The tickets will be on sale next Sunday. We're having a catered meal, and for dessert, this will be the infamous Deacon Staff Dessert throw down. We know how the staff feels about that one. <laughs> so deacons, you got to do your best. We got to try to challenge them this year. Uh, you won't want to miss it, folks. Saturday, uh, February the 16th, and the tickets will be $6. And also this Wednesday, we will be having, it says, Linda's Homemade Pork Barbecue. That's me. <laughs> My homemade pork barbecue dinner is uh, this Wednesday night. So if you would like to come, Please use a tear-off flap in your bulletin to make a reservation or call the church office by Monday. So you can see more information about the upcoming events in your bulletin. So I'd like for you to take a look at that, and we will continue our worship as Charles White comes to play for us.
Deep River is one of the most beloved of the black spirituals, also known as a slave song. As you'll see, the words will be on the screen before you. You notice reference to the River Jordan. We think of crossing the Jordan, we think of crossing over into heaven. But among the slaves, it had a different meaning. The Ohio River was referred to as River Jordan. Because as they crossed the Ohio River, they crossed into their promised land as Israelites did. They crossed into their land of freedom. So the deep river flows close to our home. The text of the hymn and spiritual, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me, certainly fits the context of slavery, but also speaks to us today when we go through times of trial and heartache, when we just need that companionship of the Lord. This will be our offertory hymn this morning. Let's stand and sing, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. <laughs> Thank you. 
receive this morning's offering. Last Sunday would have been our benevolence offering for the month. And so I'm going to ask our deacons to uh, receive an offering at the end of the service today at both of the doors that goes into the Deacon Benevolence Fund to help folks in our church and our community. Any day I hold a white envelope is a good day. The metal ministry has been at it even in bitter cold weather. And I'm happy to tell you that this another $1,000 makes a total of the scrap metal ministry of $102,000 for our uh, way forward. <laughs> Thank you to those, whoever, I don't know, whoever matched this with $500. And thank you to the donors of the scrap. Every day I would look out my window and the truck was empty one day and the next day it's full. I don't know. If we ever stop doing this, we're going to have a big pile of mountain of stuff <laughs> because people in the neighborhood know just to bring it by and drop it off. But And to uh, those who take it and sell it and do the hard work of, of um, processing it. Who has our offertory today? Oh, right here. Deacon Tish Noller comes to ask God's blessing on this offering. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to return to you a small part of the blessings you have given us. We ask that these things be used to further your work in all ways, O oh God, and we're so thankful for the opportunity to have these things and to be here and to, and to work with you and help bring your word to other people. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> morning. It's certainly good to see everyone this morning, especially after not being here last week. So just so you all know, I did miss everyone last week. Um, but uh, this morning, in, in the way of prayer concerns in our church family, um, we need to continue to remember Brian French, who is still in the hospital. Um, 
And I know many of you all have asked over the time, but um, Daryl Elster is having his surgery this Tuesday, so I'm sure he would appreciate our prayers. Um, and then we had received word that um, Scott Hood had been given a new cancer diagnosis, and so I'm sure the family would covet our prayers um, in this time as well. Um, but just by a show of hands, how many here would also say, you know, I have some things on my heart, please remember me? So all of us. Um, will you all join me in prayer this morning? Loving God, we come to you this morning and we give you thanks for the gift of another day. And we give you thanks for this church family and for the ways in which we support each other and love each other, and the ways in which we're able to learn from each other and, and journey through life together. But even as we gather here this morning, we have concerns within our church family and even concerns privately that we haven't even spoken. And we just want to lift all of those up to you this day. And in each and every one of those circumstances, whether they've been named or not, we just pray for your, your peace, for your comfort, for your strength. We pray for healing in those areas where we need it. We pray that we're reminded of your presence, whether that be through some experience that we have where we just sense that you're with us, or whether it be through the encouraging and kind words of someone else. And we just thank you that no matter what we experience, that you are with us. And this morning, we, we give you thanks for the, the newness that is, is beginning to take form in the life of this church. And we just pray that you be with us in the days ahead as we continue as a church family to discern your leadership and to how you would have us to serve the community and the world around us. And we're reminded that you call us as your church to be your presence, to be your body in the world. And we pray that as we seek to live into that calling, that we not get so wrapped up in each of us being a hand or a foot, that we lose sight of the fact that we need each other. And more importantly, that we lose sight of the mission that you place before us. We ask that you teach us each and every day how to live into that calling to bear your presence to the world around us as together we pray the prayer that Jesus continues to teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, 
it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. If the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker or indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the part, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and all God's people say, Children pray, Lord, save. 
We have a new blessing in the church family. Uh, the Stevens have a new grandbaby. Their first, her name, I sent out an email, it was a boy. I saw the bow in her hair and figured out that was probably not the case. Um, her name is Oakley Sue Ellen Stevens, and she's healthy, and mom and dad are doing fine, right, Mark? So it's Mark and Laurel's first grandchild, and Bob and Marty Stevens, I guess this is their first great-grandchild, isn't it? So congratulations to the Stevens family. I've got props today. I want us to tie these two scripture passages together that Kelly read and then the one that uh, Debbie read. 587 years before the birth of Jesus, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and carried off the tribes of Judah and Benjamin back to Babylon, where they lived in a ghetto there in Babylon for 60 years. They lost their homes, their farms, their work. They lost the temple. And along the line, they began to lose the Hebrew language. And when they got back 60 years later to Jerusalem... They had lost the ability, many of them, to be farmers, and they became um, brokers. The Jews, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, learned how to trade while they were in Babylon because they did not have farms and shops. And when they came back, many of them spoke the language of the Babylonians, Aramaic which, of course, was the daily language that Jesus spoke. When Jesus ordered a hamburger, he ordered it in Aramaic, more than likely. And now they've come back from Babylon to Jerusalem. And they have to rebuild their homes, and they have to rebuild the city. And a man named Zerubbabel was the architect that directed the reconstruction of a new temple in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was the man who was responsible for the building of the new wall around the city of Jerusalem. And it was Ezra the priest that reinstituted the sacrificial system, which they did not have while they were in Babylon the animals that were sacrificed there in the temple. It, it was Ezra's job. But they lost something else. They lost the Bible while they were in, in Babylon. And now Ezra has invited everybody into the square, in front of the gate, men and women and children, and he stood up and he began to read the scroll. The text says open the book, but they didn't have folios yet. They had a scroll. And Ezra began to read, and many of them did not understand what he was saying. He was reading in Hebrew. And they had to bring in a translator. And as the people listened to the words of the Bible, they stood. And for a couple of hours, they stood and listened to the Bible. And then they responded to that in worship by lying flat on the ground. They fell on their faces and worship the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I love that. And then, this is how we know they were Baptist people. They had a potluck dinner. <laughs> Except they weren't Baptist in the South because they had uh, sweet wine. That would be Northern Baptist. 
and they had they ate fat. Now that <laughs> that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Uh, choice meats is what the is what the Bible says. Uh, NIV translated they ate fat and drank wine. Stuff that you could not have except on a feast day. They had a party. Because hearing the scripture and worshiping the Lord brought them enormous joy. And I hope that sometimes when you come to church and you hear the scripture, that it brings you joy. Tyler said to me the other day, you know, I'm learning so much. And I, I'm learning something new all the time. And I said, Tyler, I have been teaching the Bible for 40 years. And I still am learning things and hearing things for the first time. Just like those early uh, Jews, sometimes we hear the words and they break us. And they heal us and they change us and they transform us. The words of the Bible still challenge us. <clears throat> and now I want to take you fast forward in the other scripture that was read. The Apostle Paul is writing to a gathering. For 600 years from the time of um, the book of Nehemiah until 1 Corinthians, 650 years or so, People still gathered to worship. But after the resurrection, the Christians began to gather separately. And they didn't have a name for that gathering. They knew what to call the temple, where the sacrificial system was done. And they knew what to call the synagogue, where education happened. But the Christians didn't know what to call this gathering. And they went into Greek history, and they found a word. It was a word that meant a gathering of politicians who would gather to discuss and debate. We know nothing about that, do we? Uh, we have a word for that now, but uh, that's called Congress, I guess. But the word was ecclesia. Ecclesia. The word church is a later, much later translation. Ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly. And so from its earliest days, the church gathered and discussed how are we going to find our way in this world. There's a meme that goes around Facebook, and people will take that picture, take a picture and put... Um, Word, these words on it, we're all just walking each other home. Isn't that a great idea? And the gathering really was just trying to walk each other home. Paul had something to say about that in 1 Corinthians, in the 12th chapter. He said, in all of the ecclesias, in all of the gatherings around the ancient world, in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in uh, Rome, in Jerusalem, they were all different. And they all had different uh, struggles, different opportunities, different strengths, different weaknesses. But they had one thing in common in all of the gatherings of that day. This is it. Jesus is Lord. It was the one constant, constant in all of the churches. You may do things differently in that, in Ephesus, as you do it in Smyrna, as you do it in Alexandria, as you do it in, um, in Rome, as you do it in Jerusalem, as you do it in Philippi. You'll do things differently. But here's the constant. Jesus is Lord. And all were welcome in the ecclesia who made that personal proclamation. Jesus is my Lord. Now, that's 
easy for us to say, I guess. But often those words, Jesus was, is Lord, were done at the, that were said at the risk of your very life. A man named Polycarp was the bishop of um, Smyrna in about 150 A.D. It was still a day when obedience to Caesar was dictated across the empire. And not just obedience, but the worship of Caesar as a god. Quadratus was the proconsul, the Roman representative, who brought the 86-year-old bishop, leader of the church in Smyrna. And he said to him, Old man, this is what I want you to say. Away with the atheist and swear by the Godhead of Caesar and blaspheme Christ and you will live. And Polycarp said, Eight and six years have I served Christ and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And Polycarp was taken to the stake. There is a great tradition that when they lit the fire, the fire refused to touch him. And so Roman soldiers stabbed him to death. So let's not for a minute think that this statement, Jesus is Lord, is something said lightly. It is the universal proclamation of the church. I heard this morning on the way here that a church, a Roman Catholic church in the Philippines was bombed this morning. And at least 20 people are dead. The church was bombed and then a second bomb went off when the first responders arrived. The proclamation that Jesus is Lord is still a dangerous word. Now Paul went on to say, we have to decide what it is that holds us together. What is it? What is it that these people who all proclaim Jesus as Lord, but yet how do they work together? How does the church find cohesion? And Paul says that even though you have different jobs in the church, it's the same Lord. It's the same confession. Jesus is Lord. Even though you have different gifts and talents and skills, you have the same Lord. And even though you have different kinds of successes, one program is just maybe a two or three people involved, and another uh, has 120 people involved. It's the same Lord. And whether the church holds 150 or 25,000, it's the same Lord. And Paul says, Jesus is with us definitely in the church. He is with us. I believe he's with us right now. But you are now his body. I stole this from a three-year-old who doesn't yet know it's missing, and I won't tell you which one it is. So I want to see, can I, we, um, Braden, will you come help me? Will you come up here, Braden? Let's see if Braden can help me figure this out. And I learned this morning in the children's sermon he's going to be a preacher. Well, maybe not. Uh, that was Miss Susan's idea. Maybe he'll be a brother of a preacher. That'd be cool. Come on up here, Braden. Braden, I need you to help me put Mr. Potato Head together. Come on up here. Have you ever played with Mr. Potato Head before? You haven't? Okay, well, that's good. All right. So I'm going to find an ear, and I'm trying to decide where the, let's see, we don't need those, where the ear should go. I'm thinking the ear should look right there. You like that? You like that? <laughs> 
Where do you think the ear should go? All right, why don't you move it? Okay, now, I got a, I got a mouth, and obviously the mouth goes at the top of the... Is that where the mouth goes? Okay, now wait a minute. I have a nose right there. Oh, let's put the nose over here. Because you know you have a ear you have an ear on one side and a nose on the other, right? <laughs> well, where does the nose go? Let's see what I got. Okay, if you got a pair of ears, you should you should keep them close to each other, right? Your sh ears should go close. You gonna leave it there? <laughs> Okay, one more thing. Where do you think the eyes go? And now we need to put his hat on his feet. Would you, would you like that? <laughs> okay, so let me ask you something. What if the eyes say, I am the most important thing on Mr. Potato Head? We'll put his hat on. The eyes are the most important, and the eye says, ears, I don't need you. What does that do, Braden? He can't hear. Can he still function? Can he still go to school? But not as function as well as he could otherwise, right? All right, so put the ears back. What if the uh, nose says, mouth, I don't need you? What's going to happen? He can't talk, or what else? He can't eat. He's got a little. He's got a tiny little. Well, he does have kind of a mouth right there. I think that's his mustache. So all the parts are there for a purpose, right? All right. Thank you, Braden. I think he's going to be a. going to be a physician one day. He knows where the parts go. That's, that's a good thing. Here's the point Paul makes. We need each other. So we don't criticize each other, but we encourage each other. When one of us is hurting, the body hurts. I got a tremendous deal on a great pair of shoes at Zappos on Good Friday. I mean a great deal. And I finally wore them last week because they were really sn for snow. And they wore the worst blister on my heel. <laughs> so if I'm walking, I was wanting to wear my um, house shoes today to worship, but I thought that was a little informal maybe. So if you see me hobbling, that's why. Let me tell you, a tiny little blister gets your attention, doesn't it? If one parts of the, part of the body hurts, we all hurt. And we respect every part of the body, not just those parts that are easily seen. Just because we don't see it or because it's sick, we don't cut it off. All contributions are needed. And we serve the way we are gifted to serve. We do not all serve the same way. But if you don't use your gift, we have all lost. And there are body parts that no one sees that are just as important. Different body, parts, one body. Different people, one Lord. You are part of the ecclesia that gathers at 11721 Main Street. This is just our gathering place. We all are here proclaiming Christ as Lord. 
we are his body in this world. I want to say one other final point. No one gets all the goodies. There is not a single person who gets all the gifts. There is no such thing in the world, in my line of work, as someone who's a great preacher and a great teacher and a great administrator and a great servant. That does not happen. In fact, some of the great, well, the greatest preacher I ever had the privilege of sitting under was the worst at one-on-one -on -one interaction with someone in his office. Um, I used to say about him um, that you had about 15 seconds. When you went into his office for a meeting at your request, you had about 15 seconds to get what you wanted in because from then on it was his meeting. But I watched him in a, in a room full of a 1,000 people hold them in the palm of his hand. In the same way, one of the, I won't say, um, the preacher I enjoyed the least, how is that for tact? One-on-one, -on -one, people came out of his office saying, I feel like a million bucks. No one gets all the goodies. It takes all of us using our individual gifts in order to build the church. What binds the church together? What binds the ecclesia, the gathering? What keeps us together? Because we're Baptist people, we understand we do not agree. But we're held together by our belief that Jesus is Lord. And by our willingness to do our part to function in the body of Christ. That's who we are. And who Jesus is constantly making us to be. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we, we confess to you that sometimes it's hard to be the gathering, the assembly. And there are many voices and opinions and ideas and priorities. But what unites us is our need for your grace and our proclamation that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. And Lord, in that place, you've called us to be together. We honor each other as each one important in the body. Each one has a gift. Each one has a function. And in this place, we serve, we serve each other, certainly. We serve our community, we serve uh, the folks around us, but ultimately we serve you. And so my prayer is that you would help us to find our place of service. That you would help us to utilize the gifts you've given to us. And that you would remind us that what binds this gathering is our shared love for Jesus Christ as our one and only Lord, our risen Savior. We offer ourselves to you one more time as your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today we open the doors of the church to you to publicly profess your faith in Christ.
to unite with the church, whether by letter from a church of light, faith, and order, or through the waters of Christian baptism, we invite you to come. As we stand, it's also a, a time for personal renewal. To ask the Lord, am I using my gift? Am I discouraging someone else from using their gift? So that we encourage each other to use the gifts God's given us. Let's stand together and sing, I'll be here to receive you.